Good morning, everyone. My name is Rencha, and it is such a privilege to be here. Thank you for having me and the team in your home. Thank you for welcoming us and opening up for us to be with you in this time that we are going to worship together, where we're going to enjoy the teaching together. I hope you came online early enough to watch this whole video that we just shared with you, that Terence shared his story. What an amazing guy. Uh, these videos that we show to you here in the live stream often are the videos that we create for our One Story Youth and Kids curriculum. And this was one of those. Now, I'm on the video team and I had the privilege to sit down with Terence and just to flush out exactly how and what he wanted to share about his story. And then also to get to be on the shoot that day. And you know what? What stood out to me about him, of course, is his smile. Uh, his smile. It's just so amazing to see that dude smile and it's there all the time. And I know you may think, yeah, well, you didn't see it all the time in the video because he was sharing on hard stuff, but it's amazing. It's just amazing to be close to him and, and there's something, there's something about him that is so precious. You know, as we were going through his community to shoot, he would just stop and just quick highs to people in the community. And sometimes it was a little bit longer, where a two minute pause and he would just share something or just listen to people. And sometimes it was longer that Terence would just stop and make eye contact and talk to people and listen to them. And you could see how he loves people. And I was looking at him and thinking, that is the way that Jesus wants us to love and to live. It, it was truly evident that he was living a Jesus life. And coming from that background where God changed his life, it's like, this is amazing. It just touched me. And, and I hope you could take that from this video as well. And I want to encourage all of us today to go out and do the same, to love on people, people around us, people, co-workers, people, family, friends, wherever you go, people you don't even know. But to go out and, and do that eye contact, to do the quick hello, to sometimes do the little bit of a longer pause, and listen, let us love people enough that they know that they are being heard, they are seen, and that they are loved. And here as a church community, also we can do the same. We can get involved. We can love one another. We can, there's so many different ways here at the Meeting House. You can go online and, and check out the website and see where you can get involved. We often talk about the home churches. We talk about other ministries, things where you can get involved. There's events and so on. And, and see where there's a good fit for you, where you want to share, where you want to plug in something that'll be good for you, where you can share your gifts. And if it is just a matter of, I need a community, then don't be shy, go online, see where you can find that and try it out. Also, another way that we can get involved and to help this ministry is to give financially. So you can go online to themeetinghouse.com slash give. That's themeetinghouse.com slash give and be involved and help this ministry to move forward. It's almost time for us to join the band. They're almost ready for us. But before we go there, um, I just also want to share with you that if you are the person that is at home who wants to sing along, please feel free to do that. I know the band loves it if we also give them feedback of what it means for us to worship with them, even if we're not in the same building. Sing along if you are the person that more internalize it, where you just sit in the presence of Jesus. Do that. Be you in how you experience this worship, this time of worship. And after that, we're going to join Carmen. This is the second last teaching in the series of Reconstructing Jesus. And I'm pretty sure she's going to share with us also on how to live and love like Jesus. And I think we're going to see a little bit of Terence and what we just experienced in there. But before we join the band, uh, join me in prayer and, uh, and then we will go there. Father God, thank you for being awesome. Thank you for always making time for us. Father, it feels to me as if you are the one who makes eye contact. You are the one who pause. You are the one who always listen. You are the one who encourage. You are the one who let us know that we are seen, we are heard, and we are loved. And I pray, Father God, that you will help each and every one of us to live in that, to sit in that, and to be able to share that, to reflect that love, to show that Jesus is alive and that you are always with us. Father, be with us today, during this week, everywhere we go. 
Help us understand who you are and how much you love. Thank you for being awesome. Thank you for being with us. In Jesus' name I pray, be with us and go before us. Amen. Time to join the band and um, I hope this is good. Hello church, we are going to spend some time in musical worship, so feel free to stand and join us. Um, I'm thankful for the reminder today that we are the church, we are the hope on earth, we pray for revival and for God to use us to bring his kingdom here, so let's praise him this morning.
God, the Almighty, the one who is, who always was, and is to come. He has promised us the, promised us the gift of heaven. He has shown us glimpses of what's to come. And so for that, he deserves all the glory and deserves our praise because he is worthy.
think the older I get and the more life I experience, the more I see that we often so much miss the mark as the church. We lean into comfort, we find comfort in rules, in tradition, in religion, and guidelines to be able to gauge how we're doing. I think our motives are good, but sometimes we have a tendency, even myself, to become rigid in the way that we think, with no room to move, no room for God to change how we think. And so we alienate people who don't think like us or who don't believe what we believe. And we can become exclusive and judgmental instead of just being loving, just being accepting and just embracing people as they are with no agenda to try to change how they think or what they believe. Because religion isn't the goal, love is the goal. Religion is man-made, but love comes from God. So God, I pray that we would be open to being unraveled, to be shaken so that you can show us a better way. Would you expose the ways that we've become judgmental and the ways that we've been rigid in our thinking? Help us to be loving first and righteous second, to be more like you. Help us as the church to be a safe place for your people and not a source of pain. We pray you work in and through us and we thank you for your grace and your mercy and for loving us enough to always be teaching and growing us.
is my surrender. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? Is it adhering to certain moral principles as part of a religion? Is it being part of a community group that agrees upon a certain form of spirituality? Is it a particular branch of politics or policies that govern how we make decisions or make money? Is it just affirming that somewhere, somehow, this figure this rabbi, this ancient teacher existed? Or could it be something deeper, more relational and communal, more involved and more invested? And if that's true, maybe there are things that we need to reconstruct to understand more about what it means to believe and follow Jesus with our whole hearts, bodies, and minds. The temple, as many other first century Jews recognized, was in the wrong hands and had come to symbolize the wrong things. It was, for a start, a place that for many Jews stank of commercial oppression. It was where the records of debts were kept. The first thing the rebels did when they took over the temple in the Great Revolt was to burn those records. That tells you quite a lot about how the people saw the temple. Israel's God was coming back at last, and they couldn't see it. Why not? Because they were looking in entirely the wrong direction. The temple, and the city of which the temple was the focal point, had come to symbolize violent national revolution. N.T. Wright Although we may not have an imperial system trying to shape our lives, a cultural one seeks to make us citizens of its empire as much as Caesar did through command and conquer. Seeing Jesus as true king calls us to rise above our culture and give priority to the values of Christ's kingdom, to be citizens of heaven. Jeremy Buma. One of the greatest ironies of the history of Christianity is that its leaders constantly gave in to the temptation of power, political power, military power, economic power, or moral and spiritual power even though they continued to speak in the name of Jesus, who did not cling to his divine power, but emptied himself and became as we are. Henry Nouwen. I'm fairly convinced that the kingdom of God is for the brokenhearted. You write of powerlessness. Join the club. We are not in control. God is. Fred Rogers. My kingdom is not of this world, Jesus. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. The Apostle Paul. Well, hello and welcome to week four of Reconstructing Jesus. We have been working our way through a series where we're doing just that. We're learning more about Jesus. We're talking about who he was, what he said, what he did. And on this week, we're landing at the space of asking the question, well, what did he oppose? 
which sounds like a pleasant way to go. And so we're looking at the politics and the power of Jesus, what was happening around the time of when Jesus lived and walked and did his ministry on this earth, and the ways that he invited his followers into a different way of being, the ways he pushed against some of those systems. So that's, what we're, that's where we're headed today as we kind of land the plane in this series. We just have a few weeks left, and I just want to say it just needs to be said that as we do this, as we talk about Jesus, as we talk about the things he said and did and the ways that he walked, all of it is helping us see more of him. And that there's an invitation as we do this. All of what Jesus did was an invitation. It culminates in an invitation because Jesus invited people to go on a journey with him to become more like him, to look more like him. And so while well, specifically today we're diving a little more into some of the historical context, some of the things that were happening in the political structures of Jesus' time, I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that the whole point of it is to realize that even now today there's an invitation for us to become more like Jesus and to understand more of who he was. Jesus said in John, in one of his teachings, he said, I came so that you could have life. So that you could have life, so you could have it to the full. So that you could have an abundant life. And that, that's the invitation that Jesus has for us, is a life that is full. And so as we begin, I want to think about, you to think about, like, what invitation may you meet, need today? as we talk about power systems and political structures and what Jesus did to oppose that, what invitation is it that you need today? Whether you've been a Jesus follower for many, many years or you wouldn't even identify as one at at all, the truth is that there's an invitation always, more and more, to become uh, like Jesus, to model who he was, what he said, and what he did. So that's where we're going today. And before we kind of jump into the content of what we're doing, I want to remind you, as we have every week, next week is our last week in this teaching series, and it's really a whole morning of Q&A. And we've been inviting you all along to submit your questions to ask at themeetinghouse.com. And so I just want to remind you of that again at any point. It doesn't have to be on what we're learning about today. It can be anything in the series. Uh, Send in your questions, and we're going to have a teaching panel next Sunday to hopefully tackle a number of them. We never get through them all. We're always so optimistic, and then we never get through them all, but this is part of modeling community together is to engage in questions and continued learning together. So send in all of your questions. All right, so to get started, I want to show us a picture uh, to help paint the historical context that Jesus uh, was born into. So there's going to be a picture. Lovely, right? (laughs) Uh, You can't tell what this is. Uh, But this is a picture of a tablet that was found in the town of Preen. Now today, Preen is what would be known as Turkey. Uh, And this was discovered in the 19th century, but it dates back to the time of Jesus. And there were these two tablets, and I want to read for you a paraphrase of kind of what they say. So this is what this says, in case you can't make it out, which you can't. God sent him as a savior for us to make war to cease to create peaceful order everywhere. And the birthday of this God was the beginning of good news for the world because of him. It's quite the proclamation, isn't it? God sent him as a savior for the world to proclaim good news. He will make wars to cease and there will be peace. That sounds pretty familiar to many of us, doesn't it? This proclamation. It sounds an awful lot like the pronouncement of Jesus the expectation of his arrival, the good news that he came to bring, to bring peace for the world. As we get closer to Christmas, those are some of the like phrases we hear. The, the wording even in that, those tablets, were bringing glad tidings, bringing good news. But here's the thing, that was not about Jesus. That was the pronouncement of a new calendar based on the birth of Caesar Augustus. Right? So the point of these tablets, what these tablets are saying is that uh, the, the birthday of the god Augustus is the beginning of glad tidings for the world, was the beginning of good news for the world. And so therefore, really what they were saying is we're starting a new calendar and it marked the new way of marking time, all based on the value and the power they placed in their leader, their emperor. 
the glad tidings that they refer to, they're using a Greek word that will be familiar to many of us. The Greek word is euangelion, which really translates to good news or gospel. And so those are words we're very familiar with as we talk about Jesus. And so what's important as we talk about the historical context, this is the landscape into which Jesus was born, is that there already was a system of power that said, we see someone as so highly regarded as God that they will rule over the land and it's through their power that there will be peace and good news. And it's fascinating because we're gonna talk about, we're gonna land a few different places through this morning about the different ways that Jesus pushed against the political systems and that started with his birth. Luke, the Gospel of Luke, could have just named that Jesus was born in a lowly manger in Bethlehem, which would have pointed back to the prophecies naming in Micah, naming that Jesus would be born in this way. But he goes further to talk about the historical context surrounding that birth, saying this happened because Caesar Augustus issued a decree that the entire world would be, uh, there would be a census of the entire Roman world. Jesus was born into such a political climate. You can see the contrast. You have Augustus, whom these tablets are proclaiming is so valuable and important that a calendar system will be based on him. He was born into privilege, surrounded by luxury, and he displays his power by numbering all of the people in the world that he has empire over. And then Jesus quietly enters the world in a manger in a far off corner of this Roman Empire. He came to establish a kingdom wider than any earthly or Roman rule. And so Jesus, even in his birth, came to say there is a different kingdom that we are to follow. But you can get a sense of the environment of the political climate of the time. And that word gospel that you're so familiar with, we can just contrast it. It's not not actually just a Christian word. We've co-opted it because it means something to us. But like I said, it really just means good news. And that would have been used to announce the arrival of the king in Caesar, to pledge allegiance to this king would have been what would have granted salvation from destruction. See, peace came, Pax Romana, which is the peace that came in that Roman Empire, came through military force. And you contrast that with when the words, when it's used with the words of Jesus. Mark, another gospel, specifically says the beginning of the good news is about Jesus, the Messiah. So there's already a contrast at play for the way that Jesus came and what he came to bring. All through Jesus' life and his ministry, the Jewish people were under occupation. They were under Roman law. And while they lived far from the center, the laws, the rules, the taxations, the impositions led and ruled their life, their way of life. So we've talked about Jesus' birth. I wanna talk about another system of power that Jesus came to push against, and that's the temple. And you would have seen a quote at the beginning, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The temple was the place where where God resided. The temple in Jerusalem was the place where the presence of God was. And so for Jewish people, this is where they would go and experience God. And there were laws and there were rules and there were systems, but the temple was the presence of God. It's for Jewish people where it's almost like where heaven and earth would have met because that's where God resided. But the temple had also become a system and a structure for power and oppression, which it was never meant to do because it was the center of economic power under Roman law and under religious rule. Because yes, it was the place where God's presence was resided, but it also became the center of the banking system. This was the center of economic power. It was the center of the banking system and it was also the place where all of the debts were kept. And so the temple actually became this system or a symbol of almost the rich versus the poor. Middle class Jews were called out for all of their debts owing while the high priests lived lives of luxury based on the debts they received. So they were, there was a demand for tribute to Rome. There was an instruction for taxes to the king and there was a system that kept track of the debts of the people, of the Jewish people. And so this presence, the space where the presence of God was meant to be, actually symbolized something very, very different. People's lives were forever marginalized 
as their debts increased. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And perhaps this is a system of power and oppression that isn't so far off from what we have today. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And Jesus came to, oppress, to push against all of that. Jesus came to say this temple where the presence of God is, is not gonna be needed any longer because I am the presence of God. And so this temple, this system that symbolized so much of the power, Jesus came in subversively to say, this isn't where God is going to reside because I am the place. I am the presence of God. The presence of God doesn't just live here. I want us to look again at that quote that was in the quotes package. I think it helps paint a picture for us. Israel's God was coming back at last and they couldn't see it. Why not? Because they were looking in the entirely wrong direction. The temple and the city of which the temple was the focal point had come to symbolize violent national, national revolution. And we'll go to the next slide. And now here Jesus is, back again, involved up to the neck in the work of his father's work, astonishing Jerusalem authorities for a different reason. This is the climax of his father's work, and that work is now focused on Jesus himself, not the temple. This is a radical difference compared to the rules and systems of the temple. Jesus came to push against impoverishment, poverty, injustice, hunger, and debt. Those are the systems that Jesus came to say there is a different way. And his engagement with, this, with the temple was part of that. In your teaching notes, and if you're in home church, you'll look a little more closely at a passage in Luke chapter 19, where Jesus went to the temple and started turning tables. And that might be a story that you might be a little bit familiar with, but hopefully this paints a bit more of the picture to say that wasn't just Jesus coming in saying, you shouldn't sell things here. Jesus was coming to say, my way, my kingdom doesn't involve this marginalization and this power and this hierarchy of the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. And so I wanna talk a little bit more. We're gonna kinda of continue on the journey. We've talked about his birth. We've talked about Jesus' engagement with the temple. And I want us to take that a little further to talk about how did Jesus engage with the authorities, the ones who were in rule over him. And this is just a little bit later as we talk about taxation and what the temple meant. This was another landing spot. And I want you, if you have your Bible, turn to Matthew 22. We're gonna to head to Matthew 22 and just look at another example of Jesus like subversively saying, there is a new way, I came to bring a different kind of kingdom. And in Matthew 22, we're gonna start at verse 15. But before we read verse 15, uh, as, you're, as you're scanning the chapter, you don't have to read it, but just before verse 15 where we're gonna start, Jesus is talking about the kingdom because this is what Jesus did. When Jesus came, he came over and over and over with all of his words to say, I came to bring a different way. And a couple Sundays ago, we listened to the sermon that Jesus preached, the greatest sermon ever preached. The words he said to say, to follow my way looks very different. And here he is again at the beginning of Matthew 22, talking about this kingdom. And he, because it was so different, because it was so subversive, because it didn't just fall in line with the power structures of the day, it was riling up the religious leaders and the rulers of the day. And so that's the context for where we're gonna start at verse 15, because they're getting really ticked off. And they're trying to trap Jesus. They're like, surely we gotta find a way to, to get this guy to slip up. And so starting at verse 15, this is what it says. After Jesus is talking about the kingdom, it says, then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said. We know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius and he asked them, whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. And then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And when they heard this, they were amazed. And so they left him and went away. 
So this is so, yeah, this is so fascinating what Jesus does. He just has this way with his words of dancing around the trap they're trying to lay for him. So in, in Jewish law, it would have been illegal to have a coin with a graven image on it. So this is why they were trying to trap him because they would have known and the Jews listening would have known and the religious leaders were trying to say, this isn't part of our law, it is illegal to have a graven image. And here we have a coin with a graven image on it, like Caesar's. And so that they really think, okay, we have, we've got him here. Either he'll tell them to pay the tax and then that compromises the kingdom of God or he'll tell them not to pay and then they're under disobedience to Rome. So what's he gonna do? And Jesus answers this in such a subversive way. Basically he says, so what are the things that are God's? What are, what are the things that are God's? And the Jewish listeners at the time, their mind would have gone to Genesis 1 where it says that all of humanity was made in God's image. Genesis 1, 26. See these coins, they only bear the image of Caesar, but all of humanity there's the image of God. Jesus, again, without saying it, was saying, my kingdom is so much bigger than a tax to Rome. So don't worry about that, submitting to someone else's power. Pay to Caesar what is Caesar's, and then to God what is God's, and what is God's? Everything is God's. My kingdom is bigger than this. Jesus is inaugurating a much bigger kingdom an entirely different way. He's saying we may be under Roman rule now, but you directly belong under the rule and the kingdom of God. And so even as Jesus engaged with authority, they tried to trap him over and over and over. And he never, he consistently was able to say, but my kingdom's different and my kingdom will come in a different way. And it's, it was these rulers and these people in authority that brought Jesus to his death. That's where I want us to land sort of near the end here. We've talked about his birth. We've talked about the temple. We've talked about the way he engaged with authorities and all of that culminated into the journey to the cross. In all of Jesus' life and in his death, he was opposing the systems of power that led to oppression and to hierarchy poverty, idolization, and in his death, it was the very systems that brought him to the cross, and I want us to read in Philippians for a minute. You can turn, it's a familiar passage to many of us, Philippians chapter two, there's this beautiful piece that's like a, written like a poem, and you can see it on the slide. I'm gonna read a few more verses than what is on the slide, but in Philippians two, it talks about this, and it says this. I'll start from verse one and we'll read right through to verse eight and the last bit is there. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing at a selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility, value others about yourselves, above yourselves, Don't look to your own interests, but to the interests of others. All of these words point to the way that Jesus had invited them to live. This is the Apostle Paul writing to followers of Jesus, saying these ways, these things are countercultural because this this isn't what the systems of power of our day invite us to do. And even now, these things can be countercultural. And then he says this in verse five, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He made himself nothing. That pronouncement at the beginning of Caesar Augustus and the significant, magnitude, powerful, all-encompassing, overseeing the Roman world, life that he lived. And then you have the birth of Jesus. And the whole journey of his life, he poured himself out and said, this is how my kingdom will come about, is by modeling the life of a servant. And it's so fascinating as we walk with Jesus, the journey to his death, I want to point out There's two verses in Luke 23, and I know I'm making you flip around a lot. You don't have to go there if you don't want, but I sat this as I was studying this week, and if this doesn't 
if this doesn't capitalize or like show us that Jesus in his humility laid down every ounce of power he had so that the movement of his kingdom could come forward. In Luke 23, we see Jesus being brought before the powerful authorities of the day. And I'm going to read a few verses in Luke 23, verses 2 and 3. So they, they're taking Jesus, they've led him off to Pilate. And they say, and they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man, they're talking about Jesus, we have found this man to be subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be the Messiah, a king which really would have ticked them off because they already had a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And what does Jesus say? You have said so, Jesus replied. And that the whole chapter in Luke 23 goes on to talk about him being put on trial and being put before the people. And so you have Pilate bringing in the king, King Herod, and they're talking, and a few verses later in verse... Uh, 13 and 14, it says this, Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and he, he said to them, you brought me this man as one who was inciting a rebellion, the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence, and I have found no basis for your charges against him, and neither has Herod. Even up to his death, they couldn't find a way that Jesus had done anything illegal or anything wrong but what did they notice? That he was subverting their systems of power right up until his death. He turned power on his head. They didn't know what to do with him. And this is that invitation part that we talked about at the beginning. This is what Jesus invites us into, to press against power, to flip it on its head, to do the subversive work of pressing against oppression and poverty and injustice and hierarchy. The way of Jesus is not one of power. The way of Jesus is to humble yourself, to come as a servant. He spoke of a kingdom greater than the one that we were living in. And so I wanna invite us to think about what are the ways we are living in systems of power now? What's around us that points to those things that Jesus over and over and over again pressed and pushed against and opposed and said, this way is not my way. The way I'm inviting you into looks radically different. This is the full life that Jesus came to invite us to. To follow his way brings a new way to the world around us because of how Jesus lived, because of what he modeled. Lives were for transformed and changed. And ours can be too. He invites you into that and me into that. Jesus, all along the way, in every example he gave, every step he took in ministry, he was inviting. He was saying, come. Come, come follow this. Come follow me. It will look different. This way won't make sense. But it is a life worth living. He says, I came so that you could have life and so that you could have it to the full. And this is what he was talking about. And as we kind of summarize these last four weeks of looking at who Jesus was, what he said and what he did and what he opposed, we're painting a picture of the life that we're all invited into. And as we talk about power, it wasn't as though Jesus was without power. He had all authority given to him by God. He just chose to lay it down. And in his death and resurrection, and then as he left his disciples, he actually left them with this power. He said to them, I am leaving you with a gift. I am giving you my Holy Spirit. And that's true of all of us now, too. That wasn't just a one-time deal gift for the 12 followers of his, or the 72 followers of his, or the thousands of people that came to follow his way, because his way was quite captivating. For anyone who follows Jesus, we are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And do you know what that means? It means that we have access to the power that Jesus had. And so when we live in a world that presses and pushes and corrals us into systems of power and ways of being that sort of follow one track, we have the Holy Spirit's power to give us the courage and the boldness and the wisdom to say there's a different way that brings justice and brings fairness and looks to the margins and brings freedom. 
And so Jesus says, I am leaving you with a gift. And so if you're sitting there, wherever you're at, if you've been a follower of Jesus for years or you're still exploring, Jesus says, come and see, come and watch. The people that followed Jesus didn't right away instantly drop everything and go. They'd actually been walking with him for a while. Before Jesus said to the first disciples, come follow me, you know what he said to them? Hey, come and see, because he noticed they'd been watching him. And maybe that's your invitation today, is Jesus is saying to you, come and see what I do. Come and see how this way is different. Or maybe your invitation, if you're already a follower of Christ, is to say, do you believe the power that you have in you? There's a verse in Romans, it's one of my favorite verses. Romans 8, 11 says this, I think I have it on a slide. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is in you. I'm paraphrasing, but. (laughs) Uh, And Jesus says in John, because of the spirit, you're gonna do greater works than what I have done. The invitation is to move the kingdom forward more and more and more, and we do that because Jesus is with us by his spirit, and this is the way. This is how we press against the oppression and the power systems that were around in Jesus' time but are also around us today. And so we're gonna leave it there, but sit with the invitation you have. There is always an invitation with Jesus. And it is a life that is to the full, and it is a life that is worth living. And if that's a decision that you're stepping into, we as a church wanna walk that journey with you. That's why we exist, is so that each of us can look more and more and more like Christ. Let's pray together. Oh, Jesus. Uh, we're so thankful for who you are and that the way that you laid out for us is the way worth following. God, would you bring to our minds the ways that we need to pay attention to the systems of power that we live in, live in all the time where maybe we don't even realize it, but you're inviting us in a gentle way to press against it. Uh, reveal that to each of us wherever we maybe are. And God, by your spirit that you so graciously gave us, I pray that you would help us hear and to see the invitation that you're giving each of us today, whatever that might be. And may we have the courage to step into that. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Well, thank you, Carmen. That was really powerful and special. And I think what I love is when Carmen said, Jesus basically said, I am the presence of God. I am the presence of God. It made me think of something that Terence said earlier on in that video when he said, Jesus said to him, boy, I've got you. How powerful, how amazing. The love that Jesus has for us is amazing. Um, Yeah, just something that I'm taking away from today and I hope this was a true blessing for all of you. Next week, as you heard, is Q&A. So questions, please. Questions that the teaching team will answer. So you can go to askatthemeetinghouse.com. Send in your questions that you have about this series, about this topic. And the teaching team will look at that and try and answer as many as possible. And then also last week, the Compassion team spoke to us and they have an online survey at the moment. They want to hear your voice. They want to hear where we as a church want to be involved with Compassion Partners for the next year. So you can go online. That is themeetinghouse.com slash compassion survey. Fill that out, a few minutes only. Let's work together. Let's see where it's the best place for us, what's on our hearts, where we want to invest. And then earlier on, I spoke about getting involved in community. People, there's a vibrant community on the Discord channel. So if you want to go online, if you want to do that during the week, go and check that out. Themeetinghouse.com slash Discord. And yeah, that community is, is quite active. So it's not only on Sundays, it's during the week. I know there's scripture reading at times, so check it out. Talk to the people there. I think that is something that you can enjoy that, uh, yeah, just a beautiful community to be part of. And then last but not least, home church. Home church is family. Home church is that place where we can go on a weekly basis, where people are there for us during the week, where we get to know one another. So check it out, go online. Um, You can look at different places. There are online uh, home churches and also, of course, in person. So look at that, themeetinghouse.com slash home church. Well, I hope this was a good morning. I hope you've spent a good time with us. I hope it was a blessing for you. Have a lovely week and go in peace.